Well, hi all, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you might be. Um, I'm David Martin, I'm the president of the Upper Room Gathering. Welcome to one of our, uh, our forums. I'm particularly excited for this one. It's uh, we're, We've got a panel this time and it's a group of uh, authors, uh, academics, philosophers, medical doctors, people who are um, in ministry to uh, mothers and, and families for uh, and particularly regarding the unborn. So I'm, I'm glad to have all you here. Um, let's go ahead and open with prayer and then we'll get just dive right in. Dear Jesus, you said, let the children come to me and do not prevent them for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. We ask that you bless all of our children, bring them happiness and fullness of life. Amen. Amen. Again, I, th I want to thank you. Um, I want to use most of the time. Now I've had such a chance to meet all of you and I, I really think we want to really get get talking and in Jeanette we want to take advantage of you being here and not belabor the point all the speak all the panelists um I'll get their biographies on the website you can see uh their websites uh are uh available as well I think I leaked them into the uh the announcement and I'll also make those available on the website so um let's just go ahead and get started and that way we can get as much time as we can especially since Jeanette doesn't feel well we just maybe get had her say a few words and then she can kind of maybe step back a little. So Jeanette, um, I loved what you wrote, um, but maybe you could give us a little taste of uh, why you and John put the, this, this wonderful book together. The book is called Choose Life. Yes, well, thank you. Um, and thanks for having me on even without my uh, video on. But um, yeah, you know, this project began in 2019 and uh, John approached me with the idea and immediately I felt convicted um, because this has been a, a topic that's been near and dear to my heart since I was a teenager, really. And so um, we we sat down and um, he had already done some initial thinking and of um, what he wanted to include. And we just put our brains together and um, just try to find what are the main main issues that uh, pro-abortion defenders um, uh, used in defense of abortion and then to be able to provide uh, answers for each of those questions. So um, so the book has 20 chapters and addressing seven main claims. And, um, and each claim has anywhere from two to, I think, five uh, essays in response to, to those claims. Um, and so, yeah, we just tried to look at what, what top, topics needed to be addressed. And, um, and then we dug around researching who are uh, some of the leading uh, experts in each of these um, issues as we had a, a draft outline for the book. And we were so, so pleased with the lineup of authors that we were able to get. I have to say that the aim at, in the introduction, you know, the, to come across with the uh, compassion, you really, <laughs> fan is flowing paper, sorry everyone. You really did a great job of, of, that came through in every one of the essays. I thought it, would, they, it was with compassion, people brought good arguments, but th th at the core, I could really see that, you know, God's love was was in this. So uh, thank you, really, from the bottom of my heart. I know other people will feel the same thing. So um, John can't be with us because he's on vacation. So I would, I don't know if you knew that. So I will let you know about that. So your essay, one of the things you did is you, you brought to the book um, kind of a scriptural basis for seeing the unborn or the preborn as individuals from conception. Um, did you want to say anything about that or help us understand a little bit more about what you were trying to do in the essay? Sure. Um, so my chapter falls under the, the section, the fetus is not a person. And we have four chapters in that section uh, addressing uh, the personhood of the fetus uh, from a legal perspective, a philosophical perspective. That's um, what Scott Ray um, wrote for us, um, biological. And then, of course, um, from a Christian perspective, we wanted to look at it biblically, and that's the chapter that I wrote. And so um, for the biblical response, we see that personhood is really grounded in the creation of humankind in the image of God. And by looking at the creation narrative, we learned that 
humanity is really the pinnacle of God's creation. And um, all persons are created with this special identity in relation to God himself. So throughout scripture, we see that this special identity in relation to God is evident um, from the beginning of life in the womb. And there are so many passages that we could look at in scripture that, um, that prove this. But a couple of examples just include the callings of the prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah. Um, both of them are said to have been called while still in the womb. And I think Psalm 139 is really one of the most beautiful depictions in scripture of uh, God's intimate crafting of human life while in the womb. Uh, David writes, for you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. And so uh, wherever life in utero is um, depicted in scripture, there's a, a clear continuity of um, personal identity uh, indicating that that which is growing and developing in the womb uh, is on the same developmental spectrum as the adult uh, that that life is developing into. That's great. Um, did anyone else feel that they were bringing that into their essay or any, any comments? I don't want to leave any, I you know, just want to leave it open to, if you have something to say, please jump in. Because Scott, I think you kind of- David, I do address that a bit more philosophically. Uh, I think Jeanette's absolutely right that uh, biblically and the theologically, uh, it's, it's taught throughout the scripture that human beings have a, what I would call a continuity of personal identity that endures through time and change. And I think that's the message of Psalm 139, that in the, in, in the womb, as a child, as an adult, as an elderly man, David was still the same person through time and change. Right. And so there's something, uh, there's something about his essence as a person that grounds that continuity of personal identity. And the scripture, I think, you know, the scripture rec recognizes that, I think, for what it is, as, a, as almost a self-evident truth. Well, and I kind of think of that from a biological perspective, there's the genotype, which, which defines who the individual is. And it's unique to, uh, I think, uh, Joy, you kind of touch on this a little bit, the, the idea that the, in the genotype, that's who we really are. That's our, our genetic signature, so to speak. And the phenotype is the change through life. So the phenotype is going to change our hair color, you know, our height, all those kinds of things, but it doesn't change the essence of who we are. And I think that's what you came up. That's what came across for me in your essay. I love what Scott wrote. I love his um, looking uh, at the difference between substance and property things. I that think was excellent. Yes. Thank you for bringing that up. I was going to bring that up and, and maybe discuss that a little bit. Scott, did you want to make that distinction now or? Well, I'm happy to let Jeanette continue before she passes out from exhaustion. <laughs> I think she muted. She, I think she's, I thought she was signing off. So that was maybe my fault. So sorry about that. I hope she's well and, and listening and continuing to participate. So. Yeah. I, I mean, I can, I can address that. Um, I think that's a, a lot of what I'm trying to, to uh, get across in the essay that I wrote is that, uh, I think that given the, the framework of philosophical naturalism that is the dominant one culturally today and in, and in the academy as well, that's the view that uh, you know, all reality is reducible to what we can measure or apprehend with our five senses. Um, and that's, I think we need to, we need to recognize that you know, that's, that's a faith position like ultimately like every other worldview it is. Uh, and so it's not, it's not just a Christian worldview that is a, a faith position. Now, it's a faith position that's based on good evidence, um, but so is philosophical naturalism. And the way the naturalist views a human person is what's is generally what's called a property thing, which is a person, a person is nothing more than a collection of its parts, you know, physical parts and properties that emerge from those parts. Uh, and so there's nothing essential, there's nothing immaterial. Uh, the idea of a soul or a mind uh, is, it just doesn't fit 
within the naturalist worldview. A substance, by contrast, and I'm drawing here from uh, basically from the, the way that Thomas Aquinas uh, took the philosophy of Aristotle and sort of loosely speaking, it's a gross oversimplification, but loosely speaking, synthesized the, the, the good parts of Aristotelian philosophy with Christian theology. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is his, his view of a human being as a substance is what, what we mean by that is that a substance has an internal defining essence that's immaterial uh, that is that directs the de development or maturity of the, bi the biological entity. So it's our essence, our immaterial essence that gives us our continuity of personal identity through time and change. And we, again, again, I think that's our so substance view is a common sense view of what constitutes a person. I think that's most, that's the way most, most average people think about what a person is. And the other thing I think that's important to recognize is both our notions of moral responsibility and criminal justice are premised on the notion that human beings are substances with their, their identity enduring time and change. We would, I think, correctly laugh someone out of court who committed a crime, spent 20 years on the lam, and then comes back, is finally captured, comes back to court, and pleased that because I've changed so much physically over those 20 years, I'm a different person and can't, can't therefore be held accountable for my crimes 20 years ago. We, we would, I think, rightly suggest that that's, you know, that's an invalid argument, to say the least. Uh, and so, our, again, our views, our common views of moral and criminal responsibility, I think, assume a substance view of a person where there's this Again, there's dynamic interaction between the material and the immaterial. I, th I thought you did a really good, it, 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 your explanation is, speaks for itself. Um, and Joy, I don't know how to, you, you had this notion that the, the, the fetus or the, 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 the zygote, even, even, even the zygote, the, the infant at every stage is really sharing the environment with the mother but yeah. yet they're distinct. Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, uh, biologically speaking, I think uh, theologically speaking too. Um, and, and to Scott's point, philosophically speaking, that's all that's true. Um, the whatever form the new baby child uh, zygote embryo fetus, whatever form, whatever stage in the maturation um, he or she happens to be, it's still a, an entity. I, I loved what Scott wrote, and I I had to sort of move the cookies to a lower shelf sometimes. <laughs> so uh, F. W. Borum also spoke to this, and I love what he said as well. He talks about the difference between quantities and entities, and he says that quantities can be divided without harm, like a, a ton of coal or a quart of milk or a pound of butter, but entities cannot be divided without harm. And the entity, uh, he, he uh, visits, revisits uh, the Solomon at the um, potential division of that child. And he says, the sort of Solomon shows us this. You can't divide a baby and, into two halves and have anything that resembles a baby. Right. So uh, I appreciate that. Certainly, um, the child in utero uh, has its own um, person, uh, although our laws may not recognize that the uh, child has exerts certain influences on the mother and the mother vice versa. So I thought it was really interesting to note that um, you do care, if you've been pregnant, you do carry uh, little reminders, cellularly speaking, or in a molecular way of that pregnancy. So. Um, I was, I was really kind of that 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 idea that you're talking about there, where the mother and the child share, because it seems to me I know that my experience has been that there's a certain that whole idea of attachment that that starts. You know, the mother knows that there's something there. Yes. And it seems like it's even almost what you were saying was it was at a biological level even that it there's so much changing hormonally, not only with the mother but also with the baby. True. 
Uh, I took a year out of medical school and did a pathology student fellowship. And so I had to rotate through the various pathology um, sections. And one of those areas is blood banking. And so it's actually harder to cross match and don't I, I'm not a blood banker. I'm not a pathologist. Okay, so I need to have that disclaimer. But um, women often have new antibodies uh, in their blood uh, after they've been pregnant. So you have to when you're cross matching blood that that comes to the fore. And likewise, uh, one of the common tests these days, while the woman is pregnant is for cell free DNA. And that's fetal cell. And that you can measure that and, and uh, have um, there, there are a number of tests that can be done with that. But that dissipates soon after delivery, I think. Um, but we do retain some of the cells um, as women who've born children. And even those who have been pregnant and aborted their children still have a cellular memory of that. So so-called uh, fetal microchimerism, where you have uh, cells from the fetus. Wow. Sarah, um, maybe you could say a little bit about your ministry and what you've done, because I wanted to ask you a question about that, that maybe you see these kinds of things where, where mothers and fathers, they, they start to experience being a mother and a father, but yet they've, they've had this trauma or they need support for that. So could you say a few words about what you've been doing? And Yeah, you know, I'd say my expertise in this topic is personal and professional. I think my journey began to try to understand the abortion of vulnerable woman and what leads her to abortion's door. And in that, um, based off of my work with um, at Louisiana Right to Life, but kind of stemming from my personal history with my birth mother, who was definitely abortion vulnerable, who had previous abortions in her history, I, I, I think the Lord really showed me in like my walk with um, Christ and the scripture pointed me in the direction of a lot of these women that are in these unplanned pregnancies have this oppression driven fear that leads them to abortion's door. And we kind of see that with the data, right? That over 60% of women who choose abortion experience some kind of coercion um, in their life. And, and that points them in the direction of abortion. Um, and so my work professionally has been to provide that woman with support and the resources she needs to make a life affirming choice um, long before she's in that, in that situation. And I think um, part of that is of course, educating about fetal life, that, that, that dignity of that life. and. Um, the science behind um, you know, the moment of conception, it's a unique human person, but also um, seeing both of them, like this whole book, right, is about compassion, reaching to both of them and saying, we love them both. We want to reach out with, to her in love, understanding that the things that brought her to this, this place in her life might not be what we might assume on the outside. It's something much deeper than those things. So that's been my ministry. That's my heart. That's my hope um, for our work and abortion. So do you see, do you see people who are coming into to your uh, ministry who have this, this they, they know they're, they obviously know they're pregnant, but what is it that, that they're, what can we do to help, I guess, is what I'm looking for. Yeah, I think, um, I think because of my own experience, I've, I've had this um, great mercy and compassion for women in those situations. I think it's seeing them where they are and trying to give them practical things that we can do to help them. Um, because women in crisis, also the brain operates differently in a place of crisis than it would. They're not looking at their life 10 years from now. They're not looking at that football player or that musician or that, that, that person who could be, they're only looking at their, the moment they're in right now. And oftentimes they're facing things that we can only imagine, you know, whether that be rape or domestic violence or abuse in the home or ab abject poverty, a lot of these things that bring women to abortion in the first place. I think a lot of our work has to be in incorporating compassion to, um, to reach her and to know her and to love her. And that's something I was a recipient of in my adoptive family, just the love of Christ and um, realizing that that's a big part of why my plug ministry, I believe is so important is because that's a big part of this while also not wavering unapologetically from the pro-life conviction that that's a human person um, deserving of our protection. Right. Um, I would point out that the Q&A section is open and um, we can take, if others have questions, um, Mary and Jeanette uh, have, uh, they're still on. They're listening, but they just you're not. They, they're just not present in the in the view here. So, I'll raise my hand. Okay, Sarah, your story is absolutely compelling. Thank you so much for sharing it. And I wonder if you would like to share with some of the audience a bit of that. 
it's, sure. it's worth the price of the book. <laughs> we haven't read the water yet. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, my birth mother was a, um, an immigrant from Honduras. She came to America as a teenager. She um, had seven children um, prior to my conception. And um, her pregnancy with me was the result of an affair, unfortunately. And um, upon learning she was pregnant, you know, because of her abortion past, um, she was vulnerable to abortion again. You know, the, one, the data shows that most women who abort once are more likely to abort again. And she was referred to a chief physician in New Orleans who was known for helping women of color, minority women um, who are poor. His name was Dr. Akpalabi. And he, um, she, he delivered me at um, six and a half months. I was breached when I was born and he, um, I wasn't breathing and he advised her to let me die on the table. And um, thankfully at that time, he was under medical review in Louisiana for performing a botched abortion in 1989 uh, that led to a woman, tragically, a woman having a full hysterectomy. So my mother threatened to sue him if I wasn't given medical care. And I believe that threat saved my life because he was already in some trouble as it was. Um, but from there, I was sent to Children's Hospital Trauma Birth Ward in New Orleans, um, where I did recover. I later in life developed active tuberculosis. I spent almost eight years in Louisiana's foster care system prior to my adoption at age nine. Um, so I, I always look at my life as like a threefold, um, just blessing and, and, like miraculous um, exposure to the comprehensive work of pro-life activism. You know, my life was saved from my birth mother at that last minute choosing life and standing up against unimaginable fear, right? And just knowing what her life was like bringing another child in the world. And then the pro-life work of foster care and adoption, which I believe kind of like solidified um, my pro-life, I think my pro-life ethics that I have today. So that's kind of the short, very short version of my story. Um, and I've worked um, in the pro-life movement my, essentially ever since I left college. Um, previously, um, my adopted mother um, was involved in the pro-life movement too. So I've just been in this basically my whole life, so. I think, I think in your essay, you, you have a really, you have a family and, and uh, it's turned yeah. out pretty cool, huh? Yes, yes, it has, it's wonderful. And I'm so happy to, I have that now and that that is because my you know my birth mother made that courageous choice and i think that that's what um i just am so thankful to her and in my chapter i talk a lot about my growth as a person and finding compassion for her which i think you know when i was younger even when i was in college i just didn't have the understanding of kind of the oppression she was facing in her life so i had a lot of you know resentments toward her um but i think as i've studied women like her women in those situations, I've come to understand how to reach them better. Sarah, I'm sort of curious about this. If you, David, if I could jump yeah, in on a please. question too. What, uh, what do you, what do you, in looking back on it, what do you think made your birth mom change your mind and draw a line in the sand uh, and tell the doctor, yeah, you know, don't, don't finish off this abortion? I think she was traumatized by her two previous abortions. And I think that that was a big motivator for her and um, she was just trying to, um, she felt she had no choice, but then when she saw me like in the flesh, it was a different, you know, it was a different, like this, I have to, I have to change course here. And I always, that's what I always ask myself. I, I, that's my like takeaway from it is like, in the end, she made the right call. And if I was under that kind of oppression, would I make the right call? And I think that's the heart, if we can have that heart toward women of trying to help them make that choice, that life affirming choice, I think we'll have a, a more comprehensive pro-life community. Wow. I have a question that, mm -hmm. for each of you, and that is um, looking at today where we have this whole issue really raising its head again, right? Yes. Um, I, you know, I look a lot of times at the women on the news or something that are, that are, um, screaming against <laughs> against you all <laughs> and all of us and um i don't even know who they are i'm not sure they what do you think about the whole thing the the whole issue that's coming up now and what's really going on do you have any i'm sure you have a million thoughts i probably should have a better question but <laughs> you mean like how do we see the pro-abortion perspective as to how it was painted in the media and in culture. Yeah, and what's and kind of what's going on today. It seems like there's it seems like it's an over it's overdone, but it, maybe everything is overdone right now. But uh, 
Yeah. You know, I think um, there are a lot of, you know, I always try to have compassion on people, even when they disagree with my, my beliefs and, and everything. But I think on that side of that side, there, a lot of people who really do believe that if abortions overturn, women are going to, you know, be doing back alley abortions, they're going to be um, dying left and right, that all these kids in foster care, I mean, explosion in foster care, which are already is an explosion in foster care. I would say that there are people that genuinely believe those things and they believe because of that, the world needs abortion to solve the world's social problems. I think that's what, I think our world looks to abortion and sadly, because it's incredibly, incredibly, I think demeaning for um, a woman, but it's, they look at abortion as a liberation for her, a way to control her life. And they really believe that. I mean, I, I think there are people who genuinely believe it. Now, of course, there are people who, if y'all have seen like the riots in front of the judges, justices yeah. house and stuff and the handmaid's tail gear and all the things that they do, right, to, to demonstrate. Then there are people like that who are definitely just more um, angry and hateful toward our movement as a whole. But I think on, um, I, I would say most of the pro-choice people I've encountered do genuinely believe in some capacity one they don't believe it's a human person from the mother conception so that's that and then also they believe that women that women need abortion to succeed in the world that 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 it's a form of liberation for them to control their own lives that would be my consensus on that i'm open to other that's a good point i think there's a myth that on on both sides of this that is that i think needs to be corrected i think on you know what you see the some of the you know, some of the sort of the sky is falling rhetoric from the pro-choice side. Uh, you see that's pretty front and center. Um, and I don't think that's true. Um, I think the, you know, rough, I think what, what will likely happen if, if I understand the, the, if the leaked version ends up being even remotely close to the real decision when it comes out, uh, what will happen is it just will go back to the states to legislate it right. uh, according to the will to the will of their population. And they're about, you know, roughly half the states have already gone on record as saying that we will we will legislate uh, that our that our state will still be uh, a haven for women seeking abortion. Um, so and I think on, on the other side, too, you know, I, I, I don't want because of that, I don't want to, you know, operate under the pretense that you know, if Roe v. Wade is, is overturned, then the, you know, the, the battle is over right. uh, because it's, it's definitely not. Uh, I think it, it'll be very good news for the pre, for preborn children in about half of our states. But I think in, in the other half, I don't think much is going to change. And so for, I think the, the takeaway from that is that what we, what we will still continue to need are groups like Sarah's. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, in being involved at, at the grassroots, uh, in, the, in the lives of women, sort of one, one woman at a time, mm -hmm. um, and conti continuing all those efforts. Uh, what, I, what I haven't seen much of is the discussion about, you know, the, the personhood or moral status of, of unborn children in this. Uh, it seem, this seems to be more about w women's rights over their own bodies. Right. Um, and that's why I think, in my, in, in my view, you know, technology is making it less and less plausible to hold the view that you know, embryos and fetuses are, you know, are just pieces of tissue, uh, you know, or you know, an analogous to a kidney or a liver. Uh, you know, things like 4D ultrasound, where that's that's just that's really up close and personal. In, uh, ability to look into the womb, I think is making it harder and harder to, to hold the view that the unborn child is, is you know, not a human being, not a person. Um, but what, what I'm seeing is that the pro-choice movement is, is increasingly conceding the personhood of the unborn mm -hmm. and, and still arguing that women have the right to take the lives of their full person unborn children. Yeah. And that's where, in my view, once you concede that the personhood of the unborn, then I think you can, what follows from that is not only does the unborn child have the right to life, but I think the unborn child also has a claim on the mother's body mm -hmm. for what they need to flourish. Because if we, you know, if we took a, you know, a, a, you know, parents of a six month old who decided they had, you know, they just needed a break and needed to get away 
but didn't arrange for any care for their six month old, when they returned from their vacation, they would likely be met by police, child protective services, angry neighbors and relatives. And they would likely be charged with some sort of, you know, gross negligence, if not negligent homicide. Mm -hmm. And the reason they would be is because the child has a claim on the parents for what they, that he or she needs to flourish and to survive. And if the parents can't provide that, that's when the state steps in to, to put them in the hands of someone else who can. So I think once, once you admit that the unborn child is a person, you can, the, the pro-life physician can actually make a stronger claim than what we've made in the past. Right. And then in 73, when Roe was decided, you know, the justices at the time didn't have the, as they had limited information on the humanity of that unborn person. And we've seen so much change in um, science and in understanding human life in the womb. And, you know, I think it's like 90% of women who see an ultrasound of their baby don't choose abortion. You know, it's like, uh, you know, because there's so much, it's so compelling. It's so overwhelming. It's so clear. Um, but yeah, I definitely think, you know, it used to be the rhetoric you would hear is it's a blob of tissue clump of cells. You don't really hear pro-choice activists saying that as often anymore because there's just too much science to dispute that those claims. Joy. I think when I see activists like uh, those shown on the web from Joel Osteen's church this past weekend in different places, oh, yeah. I cringe, but I also think, and I'm not a psychiatrist, but the first thought that comes in my mind is how old were you when you had your first abortion? I think these women, by and large, are in a great deal of pain. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know that they have all aborted their children, mm -hmm. but I would think there is a high likelihood of some of it, at least. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've certainly been persuaded of the lie that, that abortion solves problems. Mm -hmm. So um, Good point. my heart aches for them. Mm -hmm. Um, a question came in, so I want to read it. It, it brings up a good point. Uh, my Christian faith tradition makes allowances for abortion in the circumstance of rape, incest, or if the life of the mother would be in danger of pregnancy. These circumstances are the minority of abortion cases, and I volunteer at a teen right for life movement in San Diego and admire the strict no abortion policy. Wonder if right to adopt it, a right to adopt these few exceptions to a non-abortion policy if people would come on board to support the pro-life movement. In other words, be a, would there be somewhat of a compromise in these situations? Um, you know, I, I would say in the work I've done with Louisiana Rights of Life, um, the our, our legislation um, typically does have an exception for life of the mother, although that's really, um, it sounds different than it actually is because in most cases, um, when a woman's life is in danger, like for preeclampsia or whatever it might be, I'm not a medical doctor, but I'm just giving some examples. Um, there's the ability to deliver that baby prematurely rather than the intentional act of ending the life of the child through like a, um, a DNA abortion or um, a late, like a late term abortion procedure, the act of that intentional killing um, we, is not the same as trying to save both lives in a late delivery of that child. Um, so while I would say that most legislation in Louisiana has um, a life of the mother exception, we actually in Louisiana just um, passed a bill through the legislature. It's awaiting our governor's signature. Um, and we defeated a rape exception to that because while we believe that um, the person, the perpetrator of, of the crime of rape uh, should be perpetrated or should be uh, prosecuted to the full extent, extent of the law. We don't believe that the, chi the, vic the, the, the child should also be a victim of that crime, you know, and that's what's really sad about th that. That situation, it is very few of abortions, um, uh, abortions for cases of rape, um, but we just, we don't believe that the child should be uh, killed because of the crimes of the father, and I think that's a position I think the majority of the pro-life community has taken on that issue of rape. I, I do want to remind everyone we are talking about with, with a few of the authors who wrote essays in the book, Choose Life, uh, answering key claims of abortion defenders with compassion. And they did that job very well. 
And on this issue, there are there's one essay that's written from another medical doctor when she's talking about preeclampsia or other other complications, where she's suggesting that's not really an abortion, that that there's some sort of a claim. And maybe Scott, you could address this as well. But there's the claim of um, self defense, or in a sense that the mother, in these cases where it's for the life of the mother, she's choosing to to choose her own life. It's kind of a, a what would you call it? A more of a, a, a kind of a, a, I don't know. There's a, there's an idea that you, uh, I don't know. Are what you talking it, about double effect? Yes. Okay. And there's an essay on it in the book and I thought she did a great job on that. So. Well, I think Joy, you know, Joy having, you know, the MD background can speak, I think better than I can to the, you know, the realities of, you know, actually, you know, how, how, how often does a, a problem pregnancy actually threaten the life of the mother? It's a self-defense um, claim is what I was trying where, to say. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, but I mean, Joy, you can, you know, you, you've got a better grasp of this than I do. I'll speak um, to the philosophical side. Exactly. Thank you, Sarah. I think you're right. Uh, in terms of usually um, if the mother's health is in danger, like preeclampsia or eclampsia, the treatment is to deliver the baby. And you hope that you get a good result with the baby, but the treatment is deliver the baby. Um, I have struggled in the past with these exclusions. Uh, speaking of the question that was asked of rape incest. Um, and I thought, well, I wouldn't want to bear a child that I would remember forever what happened to me. Then I thought, I have an MD behind my name. I could be held um, responsible, if you will, to do an abortion, potentially by the law. And that didn't sit well with me. I thought I, I couldn't do that. My husband is an OBGYN. And I thought about that from his perspective. If he uh, were required to do an abortion on for whatever reason, he has never, and I'm grateful, but I knew that if he did, I would be married to an abortionist. Those are weighty, weighty issues. And I think we need to think about that. We think, well, it's the woman's choice. That's back to the autonomy argument. But the truth is, in, in an abortion, there's really only one, if you will, autonomous actor, and that is if she's not being coerced, even so. But uh, you can't say that the child is autonomous, and you can't even say that the abortion, uh, the abortionist is autonomous, because he or she comes to work um, during certain hours, is available, and according to um, their, um, according to part of ACOG, American College of OBGYN's uh, ethical statement, they are basically told to provide this service. It's a service. So it converts people who should be in a fiduciary uh, covenant between the physician and the patient into, um, into basically customer and provider. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, that's not an appropriate view or reality of medicine, although increasingly we seem to be going that way. Joy, let me, can I ask a, just a, a follow-up question on this? How, how would you advise uh, physicians in light of what you just said to deal with ectopic pregnancies? Oh, well, that's a good question. I have read one report of an ectopic that actually went to term and the baby was delivered alive. It was growing in the abdomen. Normally, that does not happen. Uh, normally, uh, the, the usual treatment is uh, because an ectopic pregnancy is basically a child developing outside the uterus. So it's usually in the tube. It can be intra-abdominal, but it's normally in the tube, in the fallopian tube, where the egg is fertilized. Um, the usual treatment for that is uh, methotrexate and uh, or surgery to remove the tube because one of the problems is potential rupture. And because that placenta is invading the fallopian tube, it, it, it lays down a lot of blood vessels. And so the mother can, can actually die from uh, hemorrhage 
from that. So it's a case of securing the life of the mother. Because if we don't secure the life of the mother, we're, we're going we're gonna to lose the baby anyway. Right. Is what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. My, my understanding is that we were, even with the surgery, um, what that's doing is in basically inducing a miscarriage. Well, uh, actually, uh, it depends often. Different? That's the methotrexate. Um, but the, uh, if you have to do surgery, then you usually sacrifice a tube because you can't really get the uh, developing child out of the tube and leave the tube intact, typically. And that's well, a non-surgical uh, description of what goes on. Yes. That's a question we always get. We've been getting about atopic pregnancies all the time. And the pro-life movement does not see... Um, like removal of a tube or to, to uh, save that woman's life is the same as the intentional act of killing an unborn person, which I think um, it gets so muddy because, you know, they try to paint that as what the narrative is or what the story is, but that's actually not at all what we um, have done in the movement. So. Um, we have another, we just have actually a, just a couple quick points on that too. I know you probably, I don't want to belabor these two issues, but I also think they're um, these issues of the mother's life being at risk and, and rape tend to be two of the, you know, biggest reasons why people want to um, keep abortion legal. And a couple points that came up in our chapters um, that I think are really important for people to hear. Um, number one, with uh, medical issues, preeclampsia and others, sometimes it's you know, diabetes or, or different things that the woman's uh, health is at risk. Um, Kendra Kolb, Dr. Kendra Kolb, who wrote that chapter, she actually argues that um, it's actually safer to deliver the baby than to um, undergo an abortion. Um, and so it's safer for the mother. It would actually be uh, medically unwise <laughs> to subject a woman to an abortion um, because the length of time, assuming you're at, you know, a later term abortion, but the length of time it takes to dilate the cervix and, and, and again, um, Joy, you're the medical expert. So, um, so feel free to chime in, but I think that was, I think that's really important for people to hear that, um, that early delivery is the safest option for women uh, who are having health complications. And secondly, in the case of rape, which is such a, such a heart-wrenching uh, issue to even have to discuss. But, you know, I think it's important for us to hear from the women themselves who have experienced that. We talk about it theoretically if we haven't experienced it. And, um, and Paula Alari wrote our chapter um, as someone who uh, was a victim of rape and was pregnant. And, um, you know, the, she argues that, that experience of rape was so traumatizing that she wanted her life to end. And it was actually in discovering she was pregnant that she found a new lease on life. She found a new reason for living and a new hope and a new joy. And I think that's another aspect that a lot of people aren't discussing is that the child can be um, not, a, the, the woman's going to have a reminder of rape, um, regardless. Um, and that child can be something so beautiful. And this I've heard from, from a, a variety of women who have, um, I've heard their testimonies that, um, that becomes something beautiful that comes from the horrific act that they experience. And so, you know, some studies have, uh, one study has shown that I think um, of women who have been ra uh, raped and chose abortion, uh, upwards of 98% of them actually regret having an abortion and will admit to having felt coerced by family and friends into having that abortion. But 100% of women, according to this one study, um, showed that the women, a hundred percent of women who chose to have their baby, um, were happy they did. They had no regrets for giving life to their child. I think that's really important to hear too. Um, so listening to the women who have experienced that, um, I think speaks very loudly. 
Jeanette, thank you. And there are two essays in, in the book that address both these issues and they're very well written. And uh, I, I really appreciate you bringing that up. That was really good. Um, we have another question that came in. Um, uh, it says, this is a question for Scott. What do you say to the increasing number of Gnostic individuals in the West who favor abortion, who live out of their left brain? These individuals uh, live solely in abstract world that flees from the notion of reality. And he's, he's quoting or he's commenting on Yuval Noah uh, Harari. So this. Yeah, thank you, Harry, for that, for that question. Um, that's the, the issue here, I think, is not, not so much related to abortion, but to the underlying worldview um, that, you know, you have, you have sort of this odd combination of philosophical naturalism and Gnosticism at the same time, uh, where the for the naturalist, the body is everything, but for the Gnostic, the body doesn't count for hardly anything. Uh, and so living, you know, that the, the person who lives in that sort of abstract world and uh, Harry, as you put it, flees from reality, I think is in for some painful collisions with reality sort of, you know, at periodic points in their lives. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, that's a, that's a worldview that we, that is just very difficult, if not impossible to live with consistently. And so I would be, I'd be suspect of any, any, any particular moral position that emerged out of that deeper uh, view of the world. Is this the kind of the notion that you can upload your consciousness or your, the, of who you are and, and it could live over in a computer or something like that? Because that's really who you are and your body isn't. Yeah, although that's a, you know, that's, that's really a physicalist view of, of, a, of a human person because your consciousness is not something immaterial. Your consciousness is, is like everything else about you is reducible to chemistry and physics. So, yeah, I mean, it may be that the, you know, the transhumanists. Um, That's who I was thinking of, yeah. Yeah, the transhumanists are, you know, they are thoroughgoing physicalists um, for the most part, maybe some exceptions to that. But, uh, you know, they don't believe that there's anything essential. Your consciousness is simply a physical, they account for it simply on a physical basis. Right. <sighs> Something that came to my mind, um, and I, I want to, in the subtitle, it talks about uh, compassion. And Sarah, I think you've, you've brought this up. Um, this idea that if people who are maybe seeing this now, or who may be seeing it on YouTube, where, where, where are some of the services that they, you know, may, I know you, you're in Louisiana, but are there other places in other states, or is there... Yeah, I mean, I can speak for, you know, Louisiana, we have like 35, over 35 pregnancy centers in the state. Most states have what we call pregnancy resource centers, which are centers where women can go and get support during an unplanned or crisis pregnancy. And many of the times they do adoption referrals or they do parenting classes or they offer material support, help them get connected to social services. And a lot of times, you know, the media doesn't talk about these, these services um, as holistic as they are, and which is a shame because in like with Louisiana, we have three abortion facilities compared to our almost 40 pregnancy centers. We have this huge amount of support that is available for women that a lot of these clinics are staffed with medical personnel, nurses, doctors, counselors um, to help women during this, this time. And I think that what I'm, I think what something I'm really passionate about and hopeful for is that with, if Roe is overturned and you know, this month or in days or however, whenever that will happen, um, that you know, now is the time for hopefully people to see how much resources are there um, and also to focus more time and more resources, more funding on ab abortion alternatives, more funding on maternal health care, more funding on helping victims of rape and domestic violence. Like all this, all of this, all these resources, big pockets of money have gone toward reproductive health care. And hopefully now we can actually focus on real support more than we have for women. And that's something I'm, I'm hopeful for as we look toward the demise of Roe. Um, and then if, if someone has struggled and maybe they're struggling still with uh, the decision to abort a child, is there, what, what resources do, because that's the pregnancy center, do they deal with that as well? Or? Yeah. Yes, they usually do. And they, um, they offer ultrasound testing for them and um, they do talk to them about, you know, pregnancy centers never refer for abortion. So they're pro-life based and 
Um, I think that a woman in that crisis, they usually have counselors there who can talk to her, um, professional you know, mental health counselors who can talk to her about that and where she is in her life. And then there's pastoral care, pastoral services. I know mm -hmm. Catholic social charities, yes, um, you know, there, there are referrals that can come out of that. A lot of employers offer psychological help or assistance. Mm -hmm. Mary, do you know anything about maybe students, uh, student health centers, uh, or are those not available to students anymore? Mm -hmm. They do have health centers. Um, I think the most disturbing thing about students to me is that a lot of campuses have vending machines for the day after pills. Mm -hmm. So um, it's like you don't even you don't even have to see anybody in the health program. You could just go to the vending machine and get the pills that you need mm -hmm. if you are or you think you are pregnant. So I would say that on most college campuses, and I'm only been at secular colleges, but on most college campuses, you're not gonna be encouraged to keep a child in, in any way, through the counselor or, or any other way, really. Unless you talk to a human being who, <laughs> who has a, a position or really wants to help. Right. But I, I would think that may be where most abortions actually take place. It's when, when people go to college. I'm glad you mentioned that because I'm not sure when it takes effect, but I know the, the, uh, the law has been passed in California that all state funded universities have to offer over the counter um, the RU486 which is sort of not, not the morning after pill, but maybe the, the, the week or two to three weeks after pill. Um, and I think incre increasingly, this is where a lot of the pro-life you know, activism is gonna take place because now it's, you know, it's possible today for, for women. And this is, I think this is bad news for women's health, uh, but they can, without a prescription, without, you know, without a physician's referral, without any necessary, necessary medical follow-up uh, can, you know, can order there are hundreds of websites where you can order the, the RU486 um, mm -hmm. and take it, you know, take it at home. Um, and then hopefully you have, you have a physician who knows what they're doing with this in the event that in the likely event that complications ensue. Yeah, in Louisiana, we just um, passed a bill prohibiting what they call mail order abortions, the kind of abortion you're talking about, um, because it's, you know, what we found is that women in Louisiana were ordering these pills online without physician oversight, like you said, without even a pregnancy test. So like a woman in a Catholic pregnancy, for example, um, it, this is incredibly, incredibly dangerous. But I do think this is going to be kind of a new, if Roe is overturned, especially, we might see an increase in this kind of um, abortion purchasing, you could say. Um, but the, yeah, the legislation prohibits that type of um, sale to women in the state of Louisiana. But, you know, that's going to be a battle that we're going to see um, as we move along, I think, on this journey. Yeah. You know, um, Vicki Garza is one of our board members, and she is very active in this area. And she has uh, made a comment. Um, I don't know if she can uh, speak live. David, I don't know anything about technology, <laughs> yeah, but, mm -hmm. but what, what she's, oh, Scott is going to type an answer to it. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm yeah just... well, her comment is, I'll just read it. Most college health centers are against pregnancy resource centers. I know she worked in that area. Mm -hmm. Oops. Somebody got oh, rid of the question. Oh, I'm right. sorry. It's That's in the answer. Back. You go ahead. <laughs> it's in the answer uh, section there. Oh, I wasn't answering that. I was just giving a private message to Vicki that's happy to see her at my alma mater. Oh, okay. So. That's great. Vicki. So, um, and it says, and then she says, and they have strong ties to abortion clinics. Even the RAs, the research assistants, yeah. are often asked to take a student to get an abortion on that campus. Um, Joy, I think, did you, did you mention this in your essay? It was, there was, I can't remember. But the, the notion that abortion is not healthcare, that this argument oh, that it, right. 
Yes, I, I totally concur. It is not healthcare. If you look at uh, what abortion clinics, and oh, excuse me, I don't even like to use the word clinic because it isn't healthcare. Abortion centers, um, they don't have to pass inspections. If you, if you um, are an orthopedist or some other physician and you do outpatient surgery, uh, you have a surgery center, you can believe that those things are monitored. But abortion centers, no. I mean, Kermit Gosnell and others like that uh, show that there is, um, there's a wink and a nod, or maybe not even a wink and a nod. Maybe it's just totally um, uh, ignored. So mm -hmm. you don't have, this isn't healthcare. Uh, no one gets better <laughs> from an abortion. Uh, it doesn't really help the woman and it destroys the, the unborn child. So you cannot call that healthcare. Um, my husband being an OBGYN has seen a good number of um, post-abortive women who come to the ER where he's working because the abortionist is not available. They simply collect their money, do their routine, and um, the woman is left to cast about for her own care after that, for some real health care. Uh, let's see, is there any other questions here? Like, um, I had one too. And Jennifer, I don't know if, I don't know how you're feeling. I don't want to impose, but one of the things that, that also struck me in a couple of the essays was this notion of, there's a lot of discussion around um, the mother, but there, there are some studies I think that either need to be done or have been done around the effects on the father and the families. And, and I, I think, you know, when you talk about compassion, I think you really have to look at the whole thing. Of, it's not healthcare, it's not bringing, it doesn't help people in their jobs, you know, later, it doesn't make them freer in a sense. Is that, is that true? Yeah, so for the father, you know, the, how this impacts the man, I think is such an important question. And actually in an original draft, we wanted to include a, a whole chapter devoted to that topic, but we ended up having two chapters where um, the impact on women and men were addressed uh, simultaneously. So Victoria Robinson and Katrina Mosley both addressed just the harmful um, effects that abortion ha has on men. Um, psychologically, it's um, just damaging. You know, Victoria writes from a testimonial perspective just of having had an abortion and um, her, and the own trauma she experienced, but then years later um, contacting that man and just the agony that he had been experiencing. That's what I, yeah, I remember that. Um, and so this is affecting men as well, you know. Um, so I, I don't know if anyone else wants to chime in on that topic, but I think that's really important for people here too, is the fathers who, you know, have, who've lost children and, um, and have deep regrets over it. I did an interview, John and I did an interview with Moody Radio a, a while back and we actually had someone call in who, you know, a man who had um, encouraged his partner years ago to have an abortion and he's still just deeply, deeply walking in, in shame and pain from that child that he never got to meet. Well, thank you. Thank you for getting back on. I, I'm sorry to impose, but it was such an important thing that I wanted to, to bring out because I thought it was part of the book. The other thing is, is and I'm going to, I'll close with this because I think we can maybe just all of us talk to this as well is the idea that um, pro, pro life people don't care about social justice. And I think that is just a false claim as false claims can be. And it really comes out in the book. But any thoughts on that? I, I'd, I'd actually say it's just the reverse, That's um, because what I found is that even even among Christians, sometimes uh, you, you hear a lot of discussion about caring for the marginalized. But I, I rarely, if ever, hear the unborn included among the marginalized. Uh, it's very it's just it's not it's not a it's not a cool social justice cause to be committed to. Right. There are a couple of uh, different organizations that I have really no connection with, except I have contributed um, at times. Um, 
I know one is called Human Coalition, and you can go online and women who are pregnant or think they're pregnant can, can go online and they will point them to a resource center near them. Uh, so um, I don't know how widespread that is, uh, but I know that they've been growing over the years and they've, uh, and they've really able to save a number of thousands of children so far. Another is Students for Life in America, and Kristen Hawkins heads that up, and I think, or Hawkins, excuse me. Um, one thing I really appreciate about what they're doing is um, that they are working to help those women who choose life for their children to parent while on campus. That's got to be a challenge, um, but it's not insurmountable, and so I, I appreciate that. Uh, this summer, whereas uh, some people have, uh, who support abortion particularly have promised a summer of rage. Um, the uh, Students for Life in America are uh, actually proposing for their work, for their volunteers, a, a summer of service. Mm. Uh, I can't, I can't say anything better about uh, their sense of social justice than that. Mm -hmm. And I know that um, in San Diego, there's a, there's a center in Poway, there's uh, Poway, California is just up north of San Diego, just barely. Um, but I know that there's centers everywhere. And, and uh, Sarah, uh, in La Louisiana, I think you guys have done a great job there. And I'm hoping you know, we maybe can get some more information about that. So anyway, I want to be cognizant that we've, we've taken an hour of your time. And I really, really appreciate it. And I can't say enough that I, I, Mary, did you want to say anything else? Oh, I, I just agree with you. It's, it's been really wonderful to, to hear all of you. And, and it's so hard to have this conversation because you might feel that your friends or your family or your colleagues, they might feel that you're being insensitive. Because sometimes when we speak philosophically, you know, Scott, it, it, when we generalize, it doesn't always, it's not always a feel good thing. But we really do care about people. So if you need help and, you, and you're at a place, you know, where, where you can get to a center or a parish or your, your, your church, you know, I hope you can find some peace and, and, and uh, if we can get you some information, it's upperroomgathering.com and I'll do my best to try and get that put up there for the next couple of weeks. So we don't want anyone to suffer because I know this is a very, very difficult position or um, topic. So, and Sarah, I want to echo one more time what Joyce said, your story is so good. I mean, it, it really touched my heart. And I know there's a lot of people who are out there who, you know, there's a, I'm going to get emotional. I don't want to, but there's a young person who has a neat mom Thank you. because of the decision your mom made. How can that, can anything get more beautiful than that? Joy? I see. Right. Really? Thank um, you so, so much. It was wonderful you to hear so your story, much. Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. And Scott, thank you so much for your time. I really, really appreciate it. All right. So everyone, thank you. It's, it's once again, it's upperroomgathering.com. Um, we'll close with prayer. And uh, uh, if I can find it here, I'm all of the map. You're killing me, Small. Wow. That was so good. Thank you. So uh, we'll close in prayer and then I'll say good night. Holy God, help us to be active in our faith. Give us the strength and courage to defend the most innocent and those worthy of our protection. Grant to all of us that we might emulate the Good Samaritan. Bless those here and everywhere who visit the sick, feed the hungry, give water to those who thirst. Help us love and help us have love for all. Amen. Wow, great. Thank you, guys. All right. Good night. Thanks so much. Good night, everybody.